Good morning. Welcome to Erusat Network. Friend, you know today we are going to discuss North Indian architecture and particularly we are going to, to discuss an overview of uh, concept and actualization of uh, Hindu architecture and we will illustrate it through the various examples that will come from the different parts of the country. And for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio a senior academician, Professor Seema, Bish Seema Baba. She is presently professor of history in Department of History, Delhi University. And she is an art critic, uh, writes in different newspaper and uh, journals and on various issues. And her specialization is ancient Indian art. So I think her knowledge and specialization on this very topic will help us to understand this topic and give a kind of insight how to take up, how to understand the North Indian architecture. So on your behalf, I welcome her for Erusat lecture on this very topic. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Basically, we're going to talk about North Indian medieval art and architecture. And though there is a misconception that uh, medieval architecture is mainly Islamic, but a large amount of temple building activity was taking place during this time and that was actualized in architecture all over India, which was something that we are going to attempt to do. Okay. So I will just start with my lecture now on North Indian art and architecture. So we have uh, basically uh, uh, what we are going to be doing is that uh, we are looking at early medieval and medieval India. So, what we are going to do at the moment is to look at the background, how it witnessed successive political fragmentation and partial unifications in a cyclical manner. So, if you remember from the Gupta period which was more or less unified, uh, Guptas that unified North India, then you have fragmentation, then you have Harshavardhan and uh, um, Pushyabhutis again trying to unify India and then you have political fragmentation with three major dynasties vying for Kanyakubj or Kanauj, the Pratiharas, Rashtrakutas and Palas. And so you have then you, again you have a number of dynasties, the Jahamanas, the Gehedwalas, the uh, Karkotas. Uh, Western Chalukyas, Eastern Chalukyas, the Eastern Gangas, you have a number of dynasties that are vying for political space and all of them are looking at creating their own identities and they do this by creating um, certain kinds of arts as we say and they use art and architecture as a means through which ideation was communicated. By ideation, what means is that their ideas about themselves and about the region that they were ruling. So each dynasty was creating a style of art and architecture. Uh, and this, through this process, they were creating a link between polity, religion, society and culture. Because every dynasty had its own uh, religious identity. So some were Shaiva, some were Vaishnava, some were Jainas and though in their uh, each center all of these uh, identities were uh, religious identities and their structures were being made but a particular sect was favored. So this is something that a polity very uh, it could be the Chahamanas or it could be the Chandelas they would consciously trying to project uh, an idea about themselves through art and culture. Okay? And uh, they also use temple building activity as well as donations related to it through Agraharas, Brahmadeyas and such uh, land grant donations uh, linked to temples and temple employees for legitimization. By legitimization, what one is implying is that they were trying to uh, create a space for themselves in which the temple through consecration, through donation, through Abhishek uh, was uh, linking the king with the temple and the Brahmanas were the agency or the, through which they were doing this. This agency <coughs> was legitimizing their rule. 
this is because they, they were not always Kshatriyas. Some of them were Kshatriyas, but not all of them had the legitimate rise, right to rule. And this is why we have so much of temple building architecture. New dynasties came into being and with each new dynasty, you had a new set of um, cultural norms and these cultural norms were being used uh, and deployed in uh, through the temple. All right. Now, therefore, the temple becomes the center not only of ritual, but also of social and public life. By this, what we mean is that the temple as a structure is where people, the Raja, the Dvija, the upper caste would go and perform rituals. These rituals were basically rituals which involved darshan, that is the seeing and experiencing of the deity. Okay? So this was a religious act, uh, but it was also a ritual act. By darshan, some of the power of divinity was being transferred to the person who was looking at it. Uh, at the icon that was enshrined in the temple. But we see that by the medieval period, it no longer is only a religious uh, uh, institution. What it becomes is a social and public institution. This, this does because the, uh, you have the addition of number of structures into the temple, uh, where, such as the mandapas in which public and ceremonial activities were taking place. Things such as, uh, I would say things like um, uh, Mahabhojas, things like consecration and other ceremonies attached to the royal house as well as uh, you had major festivals uh, that were linked to the deity enshrined inside that were taking place in these uh, public spaces within the temple, right? Uh, this, the temple building activity was also being aided by the composition of a body of literature that codified prescriptions regarding religious construction and iconography. These were known as the Shilpa Shastras and the Vastu Shastra. As you know, Shastras are basically prescriptive uh, literature. That is, they prescribe norms that deal with uh, how a particular activity should be done. So in the Artha Shastra, you have political economy. In the Kama Shastras, you have erotic and other uh, norms of behavior that are being codified. Similarly, um, Niti Shastras. Similarly, you have an entire body of literature that is being composed in the early medieval to the medieval period, which is known as Shilp Shastrik and the Vastu Shastrik. Uh, now, vastu means architecture, okay? shilp means craft. Now, these are shastras or prescriptions about how to make a temple. What are the rituals? What are the materials? How, uh, what are the uh, results of making a temple? All these prescriptions. Who will make a temple? Who is allowed to make a temple? All these prescriptions are given in the Shilpa Shastra, for example, uh, you have Chitra Sutras, uh, or, uh, which give rules of painting, of iconography as to what a deity should look like. How many heads, how many arms, what are the rupas or forms of the deity, uh, what material and what uh, bhava should that deity project. Now, all these uh, were norms that were also regional in character. So you have the Vastu Purush, uh, the Vishnu Dharmottar Puran, that is mainly North Indian Kashmiri. Then you have Samrangan Sutradha that was supposedly being composed by Raja Bhoj. Now Raja Bhoj is the ruler of the Paramanas in Dhar, uh, which is Madhya Pradesh. So um, uh, Manasar, there are lots and lots of such texts that are being composed. These are also becoming part of the Puranas. So every Purana would have a Shilpa Shastrik uh, component. 
So you have the Agni Puran, for example. Now in the Agni Puran, you have an entire uh, portion, which is a very early portion on iconography, you know, and how that iconography is to be uh, actualized in icons and who should do it, how you should meditate, the sadhaka. Now this is a very important aspect that there are codes, but this is not it. Uh, often the local craftsmen and architects experimented and that is why you have regionalization in so many styles. So what is written is not absolutely translated. The idea of the code is being translated, but not every aspect of what is being written is being translated into actual architecture. Now, uh, what is it that actually is happening? First, the, that God in his house, the Devalya, hmm, is conceptualized in the image of the Purusha, the man, the primeval man uh, or the primordial man. And this is done through the Vastu Purush Mandala. Okay. Now, as you can see, Vastu Purush Mandala is a square drawing. Okay. It is a mandala, which is mandala is something that encloses all right, uh, <coughs> the entire uh, universe into itself. And in this case, you can see that the Vastu Purush, through the Vastu Purush Mandala, all the deities are being accommodated in this mandala. This is the plan that is made on the ground of the temple before its construction starts. This is the diagram that is supposed to be actualized into the temple. This is uh, the Garbhagriha as you can see. And here you will notice that there are four cardinal directions and a central place. This central area is Brahman. You can see uh, Brahman is uh, <coughs> where the Brahma Sutra passes through. Brahma Sutra represents the axis Mundai or the universal axis. And besides this, you have the <coughs> other uh, on all four sides. You can see that you have the Dikpalas. Then you have Rudra, which is Ishanakon. I am sure most of you have heard of the Ishanakon in the northeast. That is something that you can uh, is actually seen here <coughs> in the Rudra or the Ishana direction. All right, this you can uh, probably see, and this is your Brahma. All the other Vedic deities uh, uh, are being accommodated in each of the. Um, now, I will just take another example and these are the various kinds of mandalas that are made. These are examples of the manduka um, and the parm shine. Now, <coughs> these uh, uh, plants are also on elevation as you can see that there are a uh, you are, can see that they are also, this is a Panchayatan temple, that is there are four subsidiary shrines to the main shrine, right? And inside how you have hollow and solid constructions is something that you can also see. Each temple as it uh, <coughs> is basically square, the Garpriya is basically square. But then it is a further <clears throat> in the medieval period, this square plan that you see in the Gupta period gets elaborated into various projections and these are called therefore three ratha or pancharatha in plan. This one is three ratha. It has uh, three, three projections on each side, all right? Uh, and this is the and this is the most important. These are the on the cardinal directions. These are known as bhadras or the main projections. All right. Uh, this can also be seen as a yantra. All right, a magical or a magical ritual diagram here, uh, in which various deities 
uh, live in each circle in the square, right? Now, the temple, very importantly, is also uh, <clears throat> encompasses within it the body of the deity. So, temple itself is the deity, just like you have the icon which is the deity, similarly the temple itself would be a deity. So, you have, uh, this is of course an example from South Indian, but it also works with North Indian temple architecture at the bottom here. You see this is the Padya or the uh, foot, the Charanam, then you have the Adishtan, this is the body uh, or, uh, and the Jangha and then you have the nose or the Shukunasha in um, North Indian uh, terminology, then you this is the skanda and the shikha or the head. So, all of these are actually uh, be, can be compared to an icon. So, when you go and witness the temple, you know, not just of the deity inside, but the darshana of the temple is also the darshan of the deity. Okay, and that is because uh, also because though the, the main uh, icon is enshrined in the Garbhagriha, but you on all sides of the temple you would also have um, Parivar Devtas, that is deities that are connected to the main deity. You know, so you, if you have a Shiva uh, Linga in the Garbhagriha, that is the womb chamber, the inside uh, part of the temple enshrined, then you would have Kartika, Ganesh, Parvati, all carved on the sides of the temple. So, as you go around in the Pradakshina, you are witnessing the full divine power, okay, through the act of Pradakshina. You are also looking at narrative stories and various forms of the God. So, you could have Shiva as Arthanarishwa, Shiva as Dakshina Murti, Shiva as uh, Bhikshatan Murti. These are various uh, stories that are connected with Shiva that come up in the Purana, uh, in the Puranas, the Shiv Puran or the Ling Puran that were being composed in the early medieval, in the medieval period. So, literature becomes, uh, is actually being translated into a visual language through these temples. And this is a very important process where you can see how mythology, uh, religion, ritual are being combined through the process of building a temple. Okay. So, we will, okay. uh, <clears throat> as I said, elaborate rituals are prescribed for construction and consecration of buildings and icons by ritual specialists who were called sthapatis or takshakas or sutradas and who were trained in brahmanical theology. So, not everybody could just get up and start making a temple or, or so you had a brahman supervisor who was uh, uh, the sthapata okay? and then he had various assistants under him, the te brahman was the acharya. But, and he had complete knowledge of Vedic and Puranic ritual, uh, uh, textual tradition and uh, uh, other tradi religious traditions. Under him were also craftsmen who were similarly trained, maybe not completely, but only in their own craft. So, the Takshika, uh, the Kava, the Takshika means uh, the Kava, he would be carving deities. Okay? And uh, then you would have painters uh, who would paint, uh, there were uh, architects, you know, who were actually sthapatis, who were actually making the temple. The, all of these had to have basic knowledge of the religious texts that, that and they also had to be somewhat realized beings. So, they had to be sadhakas, not, and when both icons and temples were conceptualized, this state of realization of, of being, uh, uh, of uh, actually meditating on the design as well as on the icon 
was a prerequisite of temple building activity. Now, uh, we come to the temples per se, having done a very short background of what the temples, uh, how the temples were conceptualized. Now, <coughs> medieval temple art and architecture uh, did not suddenly start in the early medieval period. We do know that uh, though the first temples were made in the post Mauryan period and you have absidal Naga temples from Songh near Mathura and other uh, so, uh, Chetyas of the Buddhists, the first actual examples of temple architecture in a composite or a cohesive form can be found from the Gupta period during the 5th and 6th century uh, CE, where there was a lot of experimentation with form and ornamentation in the sense form that they were square, they had a small superstructure on top they could have another story on top, they could be of brick, they could be of stone, uh, a lot of experimentation took place. Ornamentation, by ornamentation we mean the sculptural and uh, painterly activity that took place in and around the temple. That is what we mean by ornamentation when we say this is the to temple ornament. So, a torana can be a temple ornament, uh, toran means a gateway, all right, or uh, the sculptures that are there per se on the temple, okay. All these are what we considered to be uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what we consider to be ornamentation or alankar. The term that we use uh, is alankar. So, uh, that it can be translated loosely into an ornament, all right. So, there are various kinds of alankars. These could be figural, these could be floral, they could be geometric. Um, that this could take place as a architectural element itself. So, an architectural element that is gets added on to the temple becomes a temple ornament. Okay. So, you in the Dilwara temple, we will be doing it, but if any of you recall, you have these very elaborate uh, toranas that are built, uh, constructed between two pillars. Now, that adds to the beauty of the temple. So, it becomes a temple ornament. Uh, besides being an architectural element, all right. Uh, temples for the sake of lucidity uh, have been categorized into two or three main types. The Shastra Sanskrit texts usually use only two, but some texts have used three. So, we will be looking at these. The first type is Nagara. Uh, Nagar is generally found in North India. Uh, then you have Dravid which is generally found geographically in southern India. This includes parts of Tekken as well as peninsular India and Vesar. Now, Vesar is uh, some a temple style that has elements both of Nagar as well as Dravid and it is found mainly in Karnataka and Deccan. Uh, it is not a very widespread uh, temple uh, construction style, nevertheless it is quite uh, distinct because it has very distinct roofs and ceilings. <clears throat> Interestingly, these are very large, uh, usually rather large um, constructions. Secondly, that they are often found in temple complexes. So, in each place you would have more than one temple. So, Khajuraho had Mythically, it had 85, but at least 25 to 26 are still extant. Rhoda, Ocean, these are all sites that have um, Chamba, um, Avanti Swami, you know, in Kashmir, uh, South India, Gujarat, everywhere. You see, Aihole, Padadakkal, uh, Hampi, all these places have more than one temple. So, obviously, there, the place itself had some kind of sanctity and wherever that particular sacred space uh, was being created through temple building activity, you had people making donations to make more than one temple. Perhaps maybe this happened because uh, you know they were not just uh, Hindus but uh, Jainas as well uh, coming in as craftsmen, 
as donors, as communities that lived in that area, but the, the entire site becomes a tirtha. Now, tirtha means or pilgrimage, which means to ford over, okay, to go bhav sagar par karna, jisko hum kehte hain, that you kind of ford over this particular uh, existence and go to the other side. So, as a tirtha, that helps you ford over. So, you have tirtha yatras, which are pilgrimages, as well as places which become sacred, all right. So, this is something that you see very much in the medieval period, in the early medieval and the medieval period coming up and, um, and that is why a lot of temples are still extant, uh, not so much in the Indo-Gangetic plain, but everywhere else you would see these uh, in Rajasthan, Gujarat, Haryana, Punjab, well not so, uh, uh, yeah, Pakistan, Punjab, Himachal, uh, Kashmir, Uttaranchal, the entire uh, Orissa uh, area, Andhra Desh, Deccan, etc. All right. Now, <clears throat> what are the essential elements of temple art and architecture as you see in uh, the medieval period? In the, uh, in the early period, in the Gupta period, these are very simple structures with only one. Uh, Garbhagriha and Arthamandapa or an open uh, pavilion in front of it. But they got elaborated as uh, the Vastu Shastras got uh, written and these therefore we can see <coughs> becoming, uh, uh, becoming very large institutions uh, stretching up to uh, a kilometer in their entirety, you know. Sometimes if there is a temple complex, it can co co uh, cover 3 square kilometers. So, that is the kind of uh, extension and elaboration that we are talking about in the medieval period. And this happens, well, you, what uh, the essential element of the sanctum enshrining the Pratima remains. This sanctum is called the Garbha Griha. Garbha means womb, Griha means home. So, it is like uh, uh, the womb chamber and this is very simple, it is generally square in plan, it has a flat ceiling and <clears throat> it is generally dark because it is right inside, okay. Why in the Islamic architecture you have the opposite, you know, you have the noor of Allah uh, in open spaces, lighted spaces where light of Allah has to fall. Here because an individual is having the darshana of the deity, this is a very intimate space that is being created where the experience is individualized. Therefore, it is dark, usually lit only by a lamp. In the sanctum, only ritual specialists such as brahmanas were allowed and maybe the main judgman once in a while, but ordinary public was not allowed to enter the garbhagriha. What the public spaces are, <clears throat> well, the antaral or the vestibule that connected the Garbhagriha with the Mandapa. This vestibule could be enclosed or it could be on pillars. So, you had light coming through it. The, uh, then you have Mandapas which are halls that are horizontally aligned with the Garbhagriha. Uh, the ceilings are elaborate and richly designed uh, because these are public spaces. This is where people um, come together. These could be Brahmas, they could be royal family, these could be the merchants, everybody is coming together. Then you have the Pradakshina. Now the Pradakshina in a Sandha temple, it has a ceiling and is within a wall. So, it is part of the Garbhagriha. In a Nirandar uh, temple, it would be outside. You know, so you have, but Pradakshina or the circumambulation of the temple is very important uh, because this is the only way that you can actually experience the uh, deity in its entirety. So, you know, the universe is being constructed through 
this uh, circumambulatory and this is not a Hindu ritual per se, this was there in Buddhist uh, and uh, Jainas as well. The stupa had circumambulatories if you remember, uh, if you could recall Sanchi or Amravati or Naganjun Kund, all these stupas have a circumambulatory, all the Jaina temples uh, have circumambulatories. So, this is a part of Indic religious tradition, uh, more than I would say only a Hindu uh, tradition. Then uh, as you enter from the vestibule, you have the Dwara. Now, you can have a Dwar also outside, but the, there is also the Dwar <coughs> in, as you enter the Garbhagriha. This Dwara uh, has many jams, that is, it has very many uh, <coughs> shakhas which are decorated. Now, this could be decorated floral or geometric or um, uh, nara shakhas, that is, having human figures or other mythical figures. Uh, then on top would be a lalat, this is known as a lintel. On the lalat you have a bimb, lalat bimb. This bimb is important because this gives us an indication as to who, which deity is enshrined within, you know. So in a Vaishnava temple you could have Lakshmi, you could have Vishnu, uh, Sheshashai, you could have Garur. So, there are, these are the kind of aspects that help us identify uh, and also elaborate the myth and the grandeur of that particular deity that is being enshrined inside, all right. Often you have river goddesses on the base of the Dwaras. These are uh, mainly Ganga on Makara and Yamuna on Kurma. Uh, which is Toto is in, uh, and uh, Makara is a crocodile and these are again something that are important because they also talk about the ritual as well as religious sovereignty okay? or, uh, and also sanctify it, provide it fertility through water symbolism because obviously both Kurma and uh, Makara are water uh, uh, and water uh, animals or uh, uh, beings and of course the Ganga and Yamuna are sacred in themselves and provide fertility for uh, and of course you would also recall that Ganga and Yamuna along with Kaveri, Godavari uh, are also sacred rivers you know that are invoked in almost every daily prayer all right. So, um, this is also helping one connect with uh, uh, sovereignty as well as ritual, uh, right. Then you have Guru Mandapas, they uh, can be enclosed by walls give and have light being provided from windows or these could be pro open halls that are uh, provided with balustrades rather than walls, all right. And then we come to the most impressive element of all which is the shikhara. Now shikhara it means um, of course something like a peak all right it is the superstructure on top and <coughs> uh, it usually the tallest shikhara is atop the garbhagriha all right and you have smaller shikharas on the mandapas. Uh, we will be doing what kind of shikharas are there. Uh, now, a shikara is theoretically solid, but usually it is uh, hollow in order to take it uh, higher and reduce the weight, all right, as we have seen in a previous diagram, right. This is the diagram of uh, that I have taken from the, the old tradition, that is the Orison tradition, and here you can see that uh, if you were to start from the top, you have the Kalasha. Now, Kalasha it means a water pot, all right, Kalash. And it is again uh, <clears throat> has water from various rivers inside it and it is put at the end on top <clears throat> and it uh, provides um, a kind of uh, sanctity, uh, fertility and also uh, works as as something that wards off evil, 
then you have amla or amlaka here which is uh, uh, on the top then you have the griva uh, here which is the neck and then you have bhumis all right in the shikhara now bhumis are stories so you can have a panchabhuma temple or uh, that is with five or a navabhuma temple one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and eleven so you are navabhuma eleven uh, bhumas so usually in an odd number of bhumis is what you would have okay so this is a bhumi then you each bhumi could in north indian cases it is uh, marked by a small amla okay uh, then you have the jangha the barandi and the jangha jangha is the main wall this is the mandapa so you can see the mandapa has a different kind of a shikhara which we will just be discussing all right and these are pedas or uh, uh, like a pyramid these are various forms uh, levels all right and then you have a ghanta kalash and this is a pida deol this is a rekha deol this is in orissa tradition here you can see that you have a garbagriha inside and a jagmohan which is kind of a mandapa um, <clears throat> outside all right and <clears throat> these are the bases here you can see base moldings so <clears throat> you can have <clears throat> uh, this is uh, you can have various moldings khur kumbh kapot etc with andrapallis in between and these are very elaborately ornamented with sculpture you could have an open pavilion with a window and eaves or uh, <clears throat> chadya as they are called uh, which later chadya you've heard uh, most people have heard of that comes from the term chadya which is taken from temple architecture these are eaves or all right <clears throat> uh, uh, the sanctum usually is raised this is raised on a peeth or a base or a plinth on which the vedi band or the foundation block is made and this is decorated with moldings that we have just seen and above the vendi band uh, is the jangha or the walls proper then you have the varantika which is at the top of the jangha and it connects it to the shikhara okay there are some more product, uh, projections on the walls to the top of the shikhara uh, on plan you have the bhadra <coughs> or the central offset and the rathas which are other projections all right let's just take an example from kandariya mahadev in khajuraho to explain actually how this functions all right so you can see the kalash here the amalak here this is the shikhara uh, this is the latina shikhara <clears throat> then you have the pradakshina uh, the jagati is the uh, plinth on which it's been raised the platform and the adhishthan all right now we come to the subsidiary shikharas on the main shikhar here you can see this line of subsidiary shikharas uh, under this this here this part is the antaral or the vestibule then you have a mahamandap here then you have the mandap and this is the ardha mandap or the entrance and you enter this through a series of steps and <coughs> as you can see all these here 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 all the walls everywhere these are carved with sculpture right in uh, because it is kandariya mahadev therefore a shaiva temple all the sculptures here would be mainly shaiva or would have uh, <coughs> other ornamental sculptures such as that of sursundaris that are heavenly damsels apsaras uh you could have uh, <coughs> vyalas that is mythical deities a lot of sculpture is incorporated into this all right uh <coughs> as i've said the entire complex may be raised on a massive jagati that is a tall platform uh in the medieval period you have panch yatana temples that is Uh, a main shrine with four subsidiary shrines at the corners of the terrace all right 
this may be surrounded by a wall, a prakara, and may or may not have a toran or an arched doorway in front of it. There are few examples in North India of temples with toranas at Nagda. We have toranas at Gyaraspur. We have the Ashtakamba and the uh, Chokamba, which is which means that there are toranas in there. But not every temple would have a torana. Okay, so in some temples, these toranas get incorporated inside as an architectural ornament at Dilwara, Ranakpur, and such temples. But it's not a necessity. Then you have distinct shikharas in most Nagara temples. There are two kinds of shikharas in Nagara temple. How do we recognize it's a Nagara temple? Okay, through its shikhara. All right. The first is known as a Latina uh, shikhara, which is curvilinear. You know, it's curves like this on top. All right. Uh, and <clears throat> it may have smaller shikharas, as we've seen in the case uh, of Kajraho just before. Here you can see that it's a curvy linear shikara, and you have these smaller shikaras as ornamentation, uh, also marking boobies. All right. Then you have the famsana or a pyramidical uh, shikara. Again, you can see here that this this is more of a pyramid. It has kind of steps rather than being in a curvical form. A curvilinear form, you have a pyramidical shikara. All right. <clears throat> now, in, from the 10th century onwards, the shekhari type of shikara becomes very important. Okay, uh, and this is just an elaboration of the Latina shikara. You know, it's not a, it's not, it's still curvilinear. All right, but it is. <clears throat> In vain of a ma the mountain Meru, you know, a lot of inscriptions say that the temple that being is being built is uh, like Mount Meru, and Meru is the most sacred of all mountains, all right. And uh, like a mountain chain, it has smaller shikharas or smaller peaks that uh, <coughs> uh, surround the central Latin spire, which is known as the Mulu Shringa. <coughs> Then you have one or more rows of half spires on the sides called Uraha Shringa, uh, and these are uh, built into uh, miniature spires. Okay. Uh, now in the corners, they, you also have quarter spires. So you have very small, uh, not fully rounded spires. <coughs> now the edges of the shikara. Are, is often interrupted at intervals with grooved discs, each one demarcating a story or a bhumi, which we have seen in, uh, uh, in the first in diagram. The shikra surface is covered with creeper-like tracery called jalaka or interlaced work composed of diminutive ornamental chandrashalas. Now, chandrashalas are uh, uh, also known as gavaksha. These are a device, uh, ornamental device, uh, but uh, then you have a skanda, then you have a griva. Uh, Famsana shikharas, as you can see, are rectilinear in height and composed like a latina, uh, but with horizontal steps are capped by a ghanta and they may have, uh, they are usually on mandapas or halls. Uh, okay. In Latina and Shikri, there are generally, they have a shukunash on top, um, which are prominent like a nose, shukunash means nose, okay, and which is rising above the vestibule. And then you have Bhumija type of Shikharas, which are popular in Central India, Malava and Western India <coughs> and the Deccan, uh, which have a central projection on each of the four faces. Uh, um, uh, today, I will just uh, do an elaboration of the various kinds of uh, <coughs> uh, temple uh, that you will find and maybe later we can do the examples of these. Okay? The medieval period saw a proliferation of regional styles of art and architecture with each 
political dynasty vying for greater recognition and legitimacy through grand temple building projects, often creating a distinct identifiable style of its own. So, <coughs> you have in the, though the Nagara style remains the same, you have distinct regional schools. In Orissa, you have the Kalinga style. In central India, you have Pratihar, Chandel uh, styles. In Rajasthan, you have the Mahamaru style. Uh, and also in Gujarat, in Kashmir, you have the Karkota style. Uh, in Shamba, you have uh, a kind of a variation of the Pratiha style. In Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Bengal, though very few temples are extant. <coughs> Sorry. There are various other styles that exist. All right. Uh -huh. Uh, you uh, just mentioned that uh, in the beginning of the lectures, uh, the temple was a kind of a visual expression of the uh, books uh, in uh, written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a kind of uh, written to uh, visual, yeah, oral to uh, mm -hmm. visual. So, um, uh, was it uh, uh, first the uh, uh, sastra came and then this temple came, yeah, the, it evolved and then the sastra was documented? Uh, that's, uh a uh, very difficult question, but archaeologically speaking, early temples uh, predate the Shastras. And the Shastras kind mm. of codify the existing knowledge and amplify it to a large extent. You have, uh, you know, various uh, Shastras being written, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you do have uh, uh, pre-existing temples also. Okay, so it means we have a different... Uh, um, the, as you told about the common element has a different mm. uh, um, uh, foundation uh, block or foundation, mm. whatever it is, mm. uh, we have uh, differ, uh, evolve over the years. Yes, you know. Because that instances must be available. Yes, you know, so you mm. have the main Pratihar style, mm. for example, as we, we should be doing it. Then. You have a main style, mm. which is the Nagara style. Okay. And then you have regional vi varieties of it. This could be based on the fact that you have different kinds of materials available, mm -hmm. you know. So in Konarak, you would have a different kind of uh, uh, stone mm -hmm. that is available. In Deccan, you have laterite and granite. You know, the possibilities of building okay. are also different according to different locally available stone. Secondly, this differentiation also comes through because you, the uh, dynasty doesn't want to, uh, the patrons do, don't want to simply uh, continue with what is happening before. They try and create a little differentiation so that their own style it gets projected. You know, okay. so you have the chandelas. The if you see in Kajrao, the kind of uh, not just the building, but the kind of sculptures that are being made are different from the uh, Pratiharas. Probably they were the feudatories of mm -hmm. the Pratiharas, you know. And when they became independent, they elaborated the Pratihara style. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as you were uh, explaining that uh, the um, accommodation of all deity in that, can you explain all the what? different... Uh, um, Hmm? No, yeah. not not in the beginning. You, you say the uh, a square shape. Mm. Yeah. So uh, again, um, back. This yeah, this, this, this yeah. yeah. What all these deity accommodation? What okay, are different okay. cones? Yeah. So that, all right. Yeah. In this, you have you know the Vastu Purush Mandala can be. Slide please. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The Vastu Purush Mandala is the basic ritual diagram. It is square but mm -hmm. it is divided into 64, 81, 108 squares. And depending on the kind of How squares, many squares? It, you have 64, okay. 81, okay. 108. Okay. And depending on the kind of building that you're making. Okay. So the sometimes, whether you're These making a palace. These numbers have some significance. Yes, okay. yes, yes. In India, 8 is the sacred. Uh, and everything has to be multiplied or divided by 8. Okay. So if you... Uh, in the uh, metrical Indian system, the Karshapana and the Arthashapana, hmm. these uh, coins are also in the eight, the scale of eight. You okay. know, so eight is the 
important important uh, number okay. important number mm. <coughs> Uh, besides that, mm. each you know e each kind of temple uh, or uh, uh, temple is known as a viman or a prasada. Mm -hmm. Similarly, a palace is also known as a prasada, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, what are you making? A domestic building, a ritual building, or a secular building? The mandala remains the same. The kind of mand uh, the basic mandala remains the same, okay. but it changes. Now, at the center, if you would see here, mm -hmm. here is the Brahma sthan. It's known as the Brahma sthan. Mm -hmm. This is the most sacred of it, you mm -hmm. know, because this is the center. From here will rise the axis mundai, that is the uh, universal axis. Okay, that connects earth to heavens. All right, and also underneath. Mm -hmm. So all the three lokas are connected through this axis mundai. This is also at uh, the center of any Vedi that you make. You know, Vedi is a sacrificial altar that you make mm -hmm. at the time of any Yajna. You know, you perform a Yajna, you make a square yeah, Vedi, yeah. and the center is the axis mudra, the mm -hmm. Brahma sthan, therefore becomes important. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, these are the four different cones. Cone, all right? Or the corners, okay. all right? Okay. Now, each of these have different names. Different deities reside in okay. this that they live in these so okay. when you make these you first make an offering to the brahman okay. but you make offerings to all of these deities you know deities okay. so you make uh, rice offerings you coin offerings phula uh, pushpa all these offerings are therefore made okay and here <coughs> you have asuras varuna indra varun and indra I, uh, if you know, are mm -hmm. Deekpalas or the guardians of the, day, uh, of the uh, world. All right. Okay. So these are directional gods, uh, so to speak. All right. So you have Yama. South is the territory of Yama. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which means that the so-called god of death. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then you have also sub directions. Okay. So you have uh, Agni, Nriti, Anila, Mriga. These are different kinds of deities mm -hmm. who would uh, live in these quarters, right? And here, living in this, you also have to make uh, appropriate offerings. Similarly, uh, not you know you have Surya, <coughs> Pushan, uh, and other Vedic deities, each having a place, even. <coughs> Aditi, you hmm. know, these are not only male gods, but female gods also, or goddesses also find place here. All right? <coughs> okay. And this is the most important of them, sacred quarter, which is known as uh, Isharkun or Rudra. This is the place of Shiva uh, that is there. Now, this Vastu Purush Mandala is made with a sanctified cord or a string, you know, hmm. that has been sanctified according to special rituals and then you take this and then measure it out and then you measure out sub uh, sections of it mm -hmm. all right and then rituals are performed so these could take five to seven days of rituals are performed before uh, the actual construction can take this this mandala can only be uh, made for a temple in a place that has been uh, first sanctified mm -hmm. identified sanctified leveled then uh, uh, you have uh, cow dung, okay. you know, uh, being put to yeah. purify it. And then you have the Vedic and okay. other rituals that are being performed. Okay. This diagram I just uh, have also, there is a way uh, to divide it in differently. Yes, there are, this is one kind of way to divide it. Okay. There are different ways of dividing it in the Vastu uh, Shastras. Mm -hmm. So, the basic diagram remains the same, okay. okay, but how many projections do you have to it, okay, that changes here, you can have, this is a Karna, okay, this is a Karna, Pratikarna, Bhadra, how many projections would you have, this is your Garbhagriha, these, these, this is the actualization of the diagram, you can see 1, 2, 3, 4 and you know, the square would go like this, this would be the actual mm -hmm. and then these are the projections outside it. That is how a temple is 
being created. Okay, so these are the uh, prescribed uh, mm -hmm. diagram for the temple mm -hmm. and the for living uh, species. Now we are following uh, Vastu yeah. uh, Sastra. Mm -hmm. So that must be a different from this. There, yeah, there are, there are some differences, but usually this is done in a square only, you know, okay, yes. uh, a square. And mm -hmm. then uh, each deity has to have a place even in a household. So what is this place is decided by the Shastris or the Panditas. Okay. okay. And this uh, diagram also mm -hmm. is uh, an actualization of the primeval man, so the head of uh, it goes here, the legs go here, you know, and the body is here, these are the arms, mm, like this, yeah. So he sits like this, in a cross-legged position. Okay. So head is towards uh, north? Uh, towards, yeah, this is the northeast. Northeast. Northeast, this is the northeast. Okay, that's why northeast is preferred. Yeah, 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 that is why northeast is always preferred. Okay. okay. And these are the skanda or the shoulders. Then his hands go like this in, and, and are placed in his lap. That is how this is actually uh, Purusha, Vastu, mm -hmm. Purusha. The Purusha is there in all the components of all the gods mm -hmm. come into the uh, Purusha. Mm -hmm. And then that particular Purusha remains in the Mandala. So okay. So actually, it's a it's a very nice concept because you when you enter a temple, you're not only looking at the deity, but in plan all the deities mm -hmm. are enshrined in there. The familial okay. deity of the that not necessarily familial oh. deity. These are all Vedic deities. The okay. familial deities are on the outside of the uh, okay. wall. So you would have, say, yeah here. So all the familial deities could be found on the outside of the uh, walls, on these walls, all right? Okay. So that is where the Parivar Devtas really mm -hmm. here, here you would have them carved. Okay. Okay. So you experience them as you go along. Okay. okay. So mm, uh, when we uh, go from our late Maurya period up to the early medieval period mm -hmm. uh, till mm -hmm. because we have covered I think before uh, 1200 century. Yeah, mainly yeah. Before, tw till 12, 12 1200 century. century. So, yeah. uh, what is the continuity and chain you uh, observe? Uh, there is basically continuity and el elaboration. Okay. You know, in the post Maurya period, you have uh, very small pillared halls with an apsidal end, right? Mm -hmm. And when you uh, go to the Gupta period, mm -hmm. this apsidal end becomes. Uh, is eliminated and you have the square remaining and outside it you have a pillared portico which is known as antaral and you have different kinds of <coughs> uh, I would say different kinds of shikharas so you can have a double dvitalas shikhara mm -hmm. which means that there are twi two stories just in say Nachana Kuthara you would have a two storied thing then you have say in Deogar a very simple shikhar a curvilinear shikhar mm -hmm. developing also at Bitargaon that later becomes much taller and elaborated in um, Pratihara temples mm -hmm. and Pratihara temples is what really lays the foundation Pratihara as well as mm -hmm. the um, Orison style lays the foundations for most North Indian temple architecture. Okay, so welfare uh, here we wind up today lecture this is a vast topic we will cover uh, it can't be covered in one hour. We'll tomorrow we'll have uh, one more lecture on this very topic, and we'll try to understand the different aspect of uh, uh, North Indian architecture, Hindu architecture particularly. And uh, I thank all of you for watching the lecture. And on behalf, I thank Professor Seema Baba for giving such a wonderful lecture, insightful lecture on this very topic. Thank you very much.